all of you. So we love your questions. We love your comments. The chat is open and um, we will sprinkle all of your comments uh, throughout this conversation. It is half an hour. It goes super fast. So start pushing your comments and your thoughts in. We will um, share them throughout. Uh, Steph and I are a great pair as always. So we just <laughs> keep the conversation live. Um, and I have to start by saying, Amy's, Amy Stanton, I know that you are on. We love you. Thank you for bringing two remarkable women to this conversation, Carol and Sue. You are here because of Amy. Amy, we love you. Um, so Steph and I host this show, Women in the Business of Sports. Um, Steph and I co-host. Steph, I love you. You know how much I love you. Um, <laughs> Steph. Uh, the Chief Brand Officer of WWE um, and my very dear friend. Um, women in the business of sports, we have a very important goal. This is really about showcasing women in the business of sports. It's not just about women in sports, in the ring, in the field, on the court. Um, it is also about the action steps for equality, highlighting the women who are making a difference and encouraging women to get more involved in the sports industry in general. Sports has been an arena for social change. Um, today, we're talking about female leaders in the industry, about the growing numbers of women in sports and why it's good for the industry and in the world. And so I turn it over to you, Steph, to introduce our incredible women in the business of sports to you. Well, thank you so much, Shelly, and you know I love you too. So I'm going to start off with Carol. Carol Capitani is the head women's swimming and diving coach at the University of Texas, where she recently completed her ninth season. Uh, she has led the Longhorns to NCAA top 10 finishes in six of her eight seasons and eight straight Big 12 team titles. She is a six-time Big 12 Conference Women's Swimming Coach of the Year. And before coming to the University of Texas, Carol spent 14 years at Georgia, serving as an assistant coach as well as associate head coach, and three years as an associate coach at Villanova University before that. She has a BA in English from the University of California, where she was an All-American swimmer, and a master's degree in English from Villanova. So welcome, Carol. I can't wait to hear all about your coaching strategies and what you learned from making that transition from being a swimmer to being a coach. No, thank and you. And now we have Sue Enquist. Sue is the former UCLA women's softball head coach where she coached for 18 years. She is also the founder of One Softball LLC, an online resource designed to bring the softball community together we're going to ask you more about that, Sue. She is also the winningest college softball coach of all time with the record of 887, 175, and 1, which is a winning percentage of 83%, and 11 national championships. During her time as coach, she produced 65 All-Americans and 12 Olympians. She is a former UCLA softball player helping to lead the school to their first national softball championship in 1978 and becoming the school's first All-American softball player. She's the only person in NCAA softball history to win a championship as a player and as a head coach. She is a member of the International Women's Sports Hall of Fame, the UCLA Hall of Fame, the National Fast Pitch Coaches Association Hall of Fame, the Capistrano <laughs> Unified School District Hall of Fame, and has received multiple National Coach of the Year and Pac-10 Coach of the Year honors. And we are the ones who are honored to have you both here today. Well, we already got to start off with Jakari R saying, dang, that's <laughs> a lot. <laughs> True that. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So Shelly, I don't know if you want to get us started with our first question. Well, I mean, just the first one, it's obviously, dang, that's a lot. You're both successful, prominent women uh, leading pro sports. So, you know, first question obviously is, what's it like rising the ranks in a male dominated field? So let's just open with that question. So Carol, do you want to start with that one? Uh, I'll start. Um, thanks for having me. It's <laughs> 
it's pretty humbling. Like I'm, we're going for our, you know, 10th national championship for our program. And then Sue's won 11 all by herself. So I'm like, <laughs> I, I'm going for my first, you know, you got time. <laughs> but, you got time. <laughs> yeah. I got to stay coaching for another 12 years at least. Right. Um, no, but I, I think I can't, I can't say that it's been easy. It is not easy. Um, but I, I think sometimes if you just, I, what I've learned to do is just kind of put it in the background and not worry that I'm one of the only females and just, I've learned to be myself and push hard for the things I believe in. And it, I mean, it's worked all right so far. You hit some hiccups along the way, but it's, you just got to push and be yourself and speak up. So that, that's how I found it. It's challenging though. And Carol, what, you know, what kind of advice would you have for women who are hesitant to get into sports for that reason? I, well, I think to be excellent in anything, I mean, whether you want to be a surgeon or a mom or a, whatever you want to be, nothing, if you want to be great at anything, nothing's easy. So then just like, why not choose sports? Cause it's the, it's, it is really the best job in the world and spending time with people and helping people achieve some really great dreams. So I think why not? I don't know. That would be I love that. I love that. And anything <laughs> we're doing is worth doing well. <laughs> right. Yeah. And Sue, so, um, from your perspective, gosh, I mean, you are just, you have such a, a, an incredible career. You know, what would be some of the advice that you would have? And, and what did you find as a coach? What were some of, of the motivating factors that you learned as a player that you then applied as a coach? And how did those um, how did that philosophy change and evolve over time? Well, I mean, I, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, Carol, I just want to say, fellow Pac-10 uh, colleague, uh, congrats on your career. I shared wall space with Cindy Gallagher, uh, our, our swim coach at UCLA. So I certainly appreciate uh, your trajectory. Uh, shout out to Amy Stanton. Whatever Amy says, she's the boss of me. So. Uh, <laughs> Amy's Thanks. the boss. That's yeah. for sure. She's a, she's I want her boss. to be the boss of me. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, you know, I think probably it's, it, I want to put it in just a basket. Um, you know, I got into sport. Uh, I'm a beneficiary of Billie Jean King's work back in the 70s. My life changed because of Title IX. So I find myself a little bit more emotionally attached to it because I was in sport before we had the rights. And we wore the men's track team practice t-shirts as game uniforms when I got to UCLA, but we had a female coach. And back in the day, in the 70s and 80s, 94% of the women, 94% um, of the coaches were women because there was no money. So one of the great byproducts of having a federal mandate in a country that says equal opportunity for men and women is the doors open for everybody. That includes men. Now men can make a career of it. So that number has dropped from the low 90s to the high 40s. And so now we've got another push. There's another sense of urgency for our young women out there to not only just go for it, when in doubt, go for it, but also to be more intentional and more active in recruiting those people that we know in our network. This passive, I open the door, this passive, I put out an application and no one applied. That's antiquated thinking, whether you're an administrator, whether you're a coach, or whether you're just a new graduate. I asked my friends, you got to go out and recruit people, bring them in, and put them in the arena so they can go ahead and show their wares, so to speak, because women in general, I have found now that I'm in the consulting business for the last 15 years, women I have found are way more talented than they give themselves credit. They always give the competitor way more credit than they give themselves. So uh, for me, it's go for it, but be more intentional about re actively recruiting those people that are in your network. I want to talk about that too, because you talked about female talent and you know especially even female coaches because what we've seen in the olympics even with female talent and coaches you know female coaches are rare at the top levels even of swimming and look at what we saw in the olympics of swimming and you know thanks to women like you carol in in coaching and the evidence in the display in tokyo uh, olympic gold medalists in men's and women's the the breaststroke um, coached by women and the Texas women swimming and diving, you know, head coach, um, helping develop such amazing female talent. 
how do we showcase the, the coaching talent and the female coaching talent and showcasing how rare and raw female coaching is so that we can develop more of that. Right. I mean, maybe I'm jumping ahead, but I do, I do think this opportunity with the NIL and, and name image likeness coming out and just being, at, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to be at like the forefront of a university that's really kind of like grabbed by the horns and said like, okay, we're going to support you on this, but putting our women out there and giving them the, the tools like to, to promote themselves and to be up there with like the best men is like the first is more the first step, I think. Right. And Carol, back up one second. Yeah. I don't want to Sorry. skip over this because this is a big new area that we are focusing on. So I want to just pause. Okay. We talked about NIL naming image likeness. And this is a whole new area, especially for college athletes that I don't want to skip over. So bring it home. Right now, a lot of college athletes need a whole education of making sure they are educated in understanding their rights in naming image and likeness. Correct. So Correct. take it home and, and educate us all. Well, I mean, the laws just changed. So, so right. Uh, student athletes now may use their name, image, and likeness to earn money and, and earn money like outside of their scholarships. So the best, like the best women in the sports, whether it's like track and field or swimming or volleyball, or, you know, like they have an opportunity to hear to really like showcase their talent and it doesn't have anything. It's just, it's about their name. It's about, the, it's not about their, their talent per se. Like it, it can be and that really helps, but that they can develop their brand and they have a lot more opportunities develop their brand and that's just like whether and they don't have to be a professional to do that anymore and i think that that's very powerful and the more we can probably do to support that but also just like the the tools you give them to to, to showcase themselves and advocate for themselves are the same tools we're trying to give them in sports anyway right like that's the only way i know how to coach is to give them the tools to speak up and communicate and care about your teammates. So, I mean, I, I think it is all connected. So we can and do- who's really responsible for educating the athletes on these, these tools? Who's giving them the tools? Probably not enough people, but I mean, I, I need to be. <laughs> I need to be really responsible and having good people around me. And that's like where Sue says, like educating the people around us and recruiting great people and going to get those people because this is a, this is a changing ball game for sure. Yeah. So you know, I noticed you smiling. Yeah, I was just going to ask for your feedback. Oh, I'm going to be, I'm, I'm retired. So I'm going to say everything that Carol can't say, right? At okay. the end of the day, Carol's leading this humongous sport at a humongous school. She's paid to win. And now there's all these other things that she's now required to be in charge of. And so, you know, we measure what we value. Mm -hmm. We value what we measure. So... Okay, administrators, if we're saying uh, we're going to open up this door, we're going to have NIL, what are we doing to provide assets, accessories, and a network for people like Carol that are in this position at the forefront of the sport? Because this is her world now. Now every parent that's reading about NIL and Sports Illustrated and ESPN is saying, hey, Carol, tell us what you're, what's your five-year strategy on this now texas is they're they're leading the charge i see them doing a lot of stuff but what about all the other 1399 colleges that don't have a large budget behind them so to be honest with you this is this is going to be a clown car for a while and the people <laughs> the people that are getting ahead of it are going to reap the benefits in the recruiting because parents now are getting caught up in well i we want her to go to a good school. We want her to win. We've got to win a championship. She runs the, you know, she runs the 100 meter. She swims the 100 meter. But we also want her to raise her social media following by 100,000. Can you do that by the time she's a sophomore? These are the questions that are going to come to the swim coach. And to me, drives, makes me want to stick a pencil in my eye. Right. Aren't you glad you're retired in some oh ways? I mean, it is, yeah. it's like a second job. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, you yeah. hit a nerve there. Can you tell? Okay, so... You can't be, I'm unretiring you because <laughs> you and I and Stefan have to have a conversation after this. And we're going to bring Amy into this. We need to have a conversation. 
because we need to take this on. So you're why don't why does it the female quotient? Why don't you this experience? Why don't you create the manifesto that's the real deal on what's going on? So we your are. student athletes can. And we're benefit. unretiring you. We're taking this <laughs> on. We're going to talk to Amy. Steph, I'm getting you in on this. Carol, <laughs> you too, because now you've just given us a charge because we're not going to let this happen. I'm not letting you there stick you a pencil in your eye. But I want to ask you another question, Sue, now, because this is about the voice in your head, because you, you know, you have an untalk. So how do you shut that voice up in your head? And I know that you're very good at this. You got, we all have these voices in our head, that imposter syndrome. You're very good at practicing how to find that voice in your head and, and shut it up and go forward with positivity and confidence. How do you do and, that? And I think just one person just commented, keep up the radical candor. So I think yeah. radical candor falls right into that. Right in there. <laughs> Give it I've, been, I've been called a lot of things. I think that's a new one. I think, I, I think the first thing that's important for people to understand is I was never the smartest. I wasn't the biggest, strongest. I wasn't the best, but I was surrounded by, I'm a daughter of a military father and a mother that was a nurse. So I have this awareness around discipline gets you to the top, but relationships keep you there. And so I live with imposter syndrome every day. Be you know, I read from the special books. I was told in high school I'd never make it at UCLA. And so I think the most important thing is to get this all out of the closet. Like, let's out everybody. Let's out, like, this fallacy. There's a fallacy out there that if you're a world champion, you're an Olympic champion. I just returned from Tokyo. I was consulting with USA Volleyball. You have 12 women that have never won in that sport. And to watch them work together around, it's not about so much, I've got to be confident. It's about being able to look across the room at your teammate and go, dude, I, I am not 100%. I'm like 60%. I'm going to give you 100% of my 60, get my back because I am scrambled eggs right now. When you get people that buy into each other, like, dude, I got your back. Don't worry about it. That is a formidable opponent. And so I always tell young women, girls that are competing, stop chasing this idea that I have to feel confident to be great. It's actually tuning into how you get there, sitting in that moment saying, oh, hell yes. I've earned the right to have joy in this moment. You can't have joy and tension at the same time. And remember, when you look to results, that's your ego. Oh, I hope I win for my parents. I hope I win the medal. I hope I win the champ. That's all ego. So if we can be aware of when you're in your ego, because if you can be in that place where I really know who I am, I'm a good person, I worked hard, I worked my ass off to get here, I'm going to let the results take care of themselves. I'm going to take care of my people and we're going to have a blast doing it. So know when you're in your ego, when you're in your weak voice and when you're in your strong voice, because just know you're just never always in your strong voice. If, if anything, it's like bouncing throughout the day. It's just this bouncing. I'm worthy. I'm not worthy. I'm worthy. I'm not worthy. Just keep moving through it. You're better than you think. Hmm. Amen. So is, is confidence not important though? So let me ask you a question because when my, my daughter just competed this morning in a horse show and I, you know, I'm wishing her luck and I tell her to believe in herself. Right. And that confidence, you know, is 90% of the success of anything you do. It's roughly something like that. Um, is that incorrect advice that I'm giving her? I mean, I'm not one to, to tell people what's correct and what's incorrect. I'm a, I'm a practitioner. So don't ask for my book. Well, you're a great ask coach. So I'm, I'm, I'm asking both you guys. The, here's the here's the key whether i'm working with a 12 year old or a 32 year old pay attention to how you got to this moment you've put in all this inventory and replay that today right before you go into that moment replay that inventory that you've earned the right to have joy in this moment and love the anticipation to game day game day is two hours you you train for five years to for these two hours let's love the anticipation because you paid attention to who you are will always be more important than what you do. But that has to be dripped as a parent, a coach every single day so it becomes their language. Because for me, conf confidence, confidence is, some, is a descriptor you use in the press conference. Like this is the problem and Carol knows this. The kids get in there and they're like, oh my gosh, I was feeling so confident. Okay, just so everyone knows in that moment, they're not like going, oh, I'm feeling so confident right now. 
it's more like, oh, bring it, sister, I'm ready. And so I think we have to be careful, especially with young women and girls, this idea, I'm looking for my confidence. I want you to look for the processes that you've clamped onto, that in that moment, you get to go ahead and collect. You put in the investments. And so it's like a shift in thinking a little bit. And I just witnessed it. I witnessed it firsthand with the women of USA Volleyball do what they did in Tokyo. And they just they really made it about themselves, empowering themselves and let the results take care of themselves. And they just, they crushed it. Hey, Carol, do you have anything to add to that? Well, I, I love what Sue said about like, I mean, that's, I feel like sometimes that's my whole job is to give my athletes confidence, but you, I can't do it, you know, but if I can teach them to just, it's, it's not teaching them to believe in themselves, but just like you, you know, comparison is the thief of joy. You can't, you just have to pay attention to yourself and get better. And, and she, the magic sauce of all this is what she was, what Sue was talking about is it's, it's your teammates, it's the culture, it's the relationships, it is the people. So, you know, if you're not having a great day, you, the 60%, but you lift up your teammates and you're digging into them, that's that's the magic sauce that helps people win. You can be the best one out there on one day, but like, if you don't have the great people around you, and, and I think that's the, you can do everything to prepare, but I think that that's what carries you in a great way, is that kind of like the culture piece, but also knowing that like, you give your best, you compare yourself to you, and then, and that's what happens. I don't know. I love, and, you it. Know, Car I love it. What Carol said is, is so true too. And we know the big buzzword, right? Like um, we're, they'll, people will want to go to Carol and say, Carol, tell us about your culture. And it, people equate that to like, okay, I'm going to get the candle, I'm going to get the poem, and I'm going to get the poster. And then we're going to go away for two days and we're going to carry tires up a hill. <laughs> Right, because we, we got that whole thing going. Let's spend, you know, nothing against that. That's important. All right, we're gonna play games, bonding. We're, yes. Can the tires up the hill? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there, can you picture that? Like, Carol knows what I'm talking about. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. That's the rapper. A great culture every single day. Every student athlete says, where am I? Who do I need to pour into, my teammates, and keep committed to the relationship of the game? It's, Swimming is perfect. The swimmers are imperfect. Softball is perfect. The game of softball is perfect. It asks the same thing every single day. 60 feet, turn left. That's the base path. So can you expand? Oh, sorry. 17 inches is the plate. Sport asks the same thing every day. People are the imperfect ones. So we've got to like, gosh, we've got to really start learning about grace. Give yourself grace. You're not perfect go in there saying i'm imperfect you guys hey team i'm imperfect it's such a relief because all of these athletes because of social media they're like ah, i'm strong i'm a woman i'm strong they're like inside they're like ah i'm like a goat rodeo right and so at the end of the day if we can say these great athletes they struggle with self-talk every day then that 12 year old goes me too but the game is perfect the game doesn't change People change, people are imperfect. And when you can learn, you take care of you, pour into your teammate and keep clamped on that the game's asking for the same thing. So that volleyball game in Tokyo was the same volleyball game they played when they were in junior high school. Same game. So, and so how do you get back into that? That's the trick in being able to do that with your mind. So Sue, go there because that ties back to mental health. That the game is perfect, but humans are not and exactly. that's the vulnerability that's the emotion the emotive side that's the emotional side do you think there'll be a new dimension to sport tying in the mental health dimension now with a new twist oh there's there's no doubt i think what's hard for um, you know, it's difficult when you're representing an institution, you've got to mind your P's and Q's. Carol, I won't, she's not going to say it, but I'm going to say it. As a collegiate coach, you're always putting everything through a filter because the unique position that Carol has is as much as we're in a, we are in a renaissance. Women's sports now is a great business investment. Mental health is now becoming a hard skill, a standardized topic. But what's unique for people that are in 
college coaching, she still has to recruit that little family from a part of the country that believes if you're a different color, you should drink out of a different water fountain. And she has to navigate where do I draw the line between excellence and access and equity and my university paying me to win championships. And I think Carol could speak to that more relevantly than I can, but I'm telling you that is a lot of pressure on a college coach today. No, that that is very that is very relevant and it, I mean it's so much cuz I think what my job at the University of Texas is to win. But to win, I have to recruit people that are like-minded and and like-minded with myself and then at least have a base understanding of what I can't teach skill if I think the baseline of just normal skills like being grateful and saying thank you and working hard like I have a I have kind of a level where I think that is and if they're starting way below that or we're on such different sides of the coin then how do I move forward from there it is and promote diversity and have a different people on our team all learning about each other like that's the it is and and also recruiting from that little town where they look at the University of Texas or my program or any great program and they think it is all perfect because they're they're looking from the outside and you realize that like on every single team you're talking about the USA volleyball team or I'm looking at my other swim programs other national championship programs if you ask the head coach candidly what they went through to get to that place there are it is it is a cluster right of just like <laughs> mental health problems injuries low confidence challenges like that's where the people come in right and that's where like digging into your people and being vulnerable and knowing that it's not per no other team's perfect no other team people aren't perfect it's per it's nah. we're, we're going to get to a point where mental health can be treated like an achilles heel and we're not there yet but we will i had I had Olympians, they, they had mental health challenges. They had anxiety issues. And we're going to get to a point where people can say, hey, you guys, just so you know, I'm managing some of my mental health. People go, dude, I got you. We're not there yet right now. We're still trying to navigate that. We'll get there, but not until people keep outing themselves that we've got to take care of these student athletes in every way so they don't feel shame. Because you, if you're out there and you have anxiety and mental health issues, you are not weak sauce. You're not weak sauce. You can manage this if you get around the people that are going to support you, just like an Achilles heel. You got to manage it. And Sue, I think that applies not only to student athletes, right? But that's throughout the world, right? That's throughout business. That's throughout sports. It's throughout life. I mean, that that's all of us being human is essentially what it is. And, and how do we encourage and coach one another, you know, just to get through life, <laughs> to be there for each other. And I, I wanted to ask about that as well, because Carol, you said, you want to recruit people who, who think like you do, but then what you said were values, right? People who, who are grateful, who um, are respectful, you know, of themselves and one another. So, so how important are our values, you know, in, in coaching and in everything that you do? I, I mean, that's one of the exercises we go through on our first week of just, I mean, it, it's, instead of pushing the tires up the hill, you know, we're going to Brene Brown's like pick two values and what, where do you go when things get really difficult and your values help keep you centered and your values help keep you in line. And then when our team understands like everybody else's values, then it's easier to understand when somebody's having a hard time, it's maybe because they haven't dug into their values or they're straying away from them. So, I mean, I, I that's correct. It, it is values, but also it's, it's unrealistic to think that I can, learn that about a kid and you know on one recruiting visit or some phone calls i mean and that's just where it, having some grace and understanding of the people around us and and that isn't that love isn't that like attention when you like like and respect those people around you even though they have different values than you do i mean i think that's that's difficult but that's that's where it is well, I'll tell you what is clear. What is clear is what love is. What love is, is creating action steps for change. And <laughs> the business of women in sports is love is action. Because if we just talk about what we're going to do, then that is not progress. Progress is action steps forward. So what our commitment is, is actions. And so we will create a toolkit for change, we need an NIL toolkit. <laughs> we create 
change forward. And I know our friends at Wasserman has also made a commitment for change. So we will be partnering with Wasserman. We will be talking to Amy, Sue. We are going to not let you put a pencil in your eye. Uh, Steph is committed to change forward. Carol, you are making a big difference. All for one, one for all. We are better together. We are going to hold hands. We are going to make progress forward. Action steps forward. All in, all in together. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Steph, always together. We will see you coming up for our next uh, conversation, Women in the Business of Sports, September 15th, my son's birthday. Happy birthday, Alex, on September 15th. He will be turning 30. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Steph, on the nose, uh, half an hour. We have never kept this to half an hour. Thank <laughs> you guys for being such badasses, doing such amazing work. Sue, we are coming for you. You cannot retire. You are unretiring because we have so much work to do. Um, but I steps agree. forward, that is called progress. Thank you so much. All right. Thank and, you. And good luck, Carol. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank see you. We're so grateful for your time. We need part Thanks. two. <laughs> we do. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank